And we are live. Very good evening, everybody, and welcome to Live Irish Myths. I am Anthony Murphy from Mythical Ireland. This is episode number 27. And tonight we are going to be talking yet again about the Irish Druids, the mysterious Druids. You're very welcome along to Folge Roiv Nadini Golair er Fodon Dawan, Goji Choch Morku Anukt. All of you are very welcome from around the world to the Murphy House tonight for Live Irish Myths episode 27. Pull up a chair, pull up a stool, grab a dram, a cup of tea, or hot chocolate, or pint of Guinness, or a whiskey, or if you're feeling really adventurous. Perhaps you might want to grab a glass of putchin. And imagine that we're all gathered uh, gathered around a roaring, crackling fire uh, and listening to some ancient stories uh, from yesteryear. Uh, And already on YouTube, Erica Rivertree is saying greetings from Louisville in Kentucky. Very good evening, Erica. First mention of this evening goes to you. And you are indeed most welcome. Tov Fajorot. Teresa McGalloway says hello again from Callahan, Florida. Uh, thank you, Teresa. And an especial thanks for you, uh, which we'll mention momentarily. Pat Rowan, YouTube running. Yes, you have us live, Pat, have you? Pat Rowan is in uh, Washington State, not far from Seattle. Very good to have you along, Pat. Autumn Piper says, finally, brackets, in capital letters, finally, I've made the live stream. So happy. Peace and love from Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, USA. Autumn Piper, you're very welcome along. Thank you for dropping in and saying hello. And on Facebook, Jack Durkin is the first of the Facebookers to say something tonight. Hi, Jack. Hello, Jack. Mariana Dunn is saying hello from Virginia. Hello, Mariana. Catherine Woodruff. Hello, folks. We are having a classic Irish soft day here. We had a fabulous day. Only got out to walk the dog this evening when it was a little bit cooler. Uh, A little bit windy, but a very sunny day here, which is great. Catherine Wall McManus. Hi, Anthony and Tua. Hello, Catherine. Ta falja rot. Alex Casterson. Evening, Anthony. Yay. More on the Sacred Druids. Yes, a second episode and there definitely will be at least one more. There's so much information. Helen Guinan is in the house. One must genuflect. And that's a private joke between me and Helen. <laughs> Yvette Tillema is watching from Keene in New York. And I hope you're keen for some stories, Yvette. Alex Casterson is saying evening to Aaron Durrett. Hi, Anthony. And dear to from County King. Well, very good evening, Erin. You're very welcome along to Chach Warku. Nick Eska Casterton. Good evening, Anthony, and hello to a hello to you, Nick. Barbara Barney says hi, Anthony. Pardon me. Hello, Bar. Hello, Barbara. Jessica Walter Woods. Hello from the Woods family in Monaster Boyce in County Louth, only out the road, home of the wonderful monastery with its round tower and. Uh, Irish high crosses uh, some of the finest examples Muradox cross and the western or tall cross and you'll have seen plenty of pictures of those from me a place I love to visit Federica Guy is saying hello Anthony and hello everyone uh, from Italy hello Federica you're very welcome Long Freya is saying hello from Sweden hello Anthony and all hope you're keeping well we well uh, in this household we are all keeping in great form well done on your local paper, bud. Glad they recognised you. <laughs> yeah, even the dog got a mention, Alex. Rowan Grove. Greetings from a fine warm day in Colorado. I'm sitting here sewing some masks for myself and friends. Fabulous thing for you to be doing, Rowan. And thank you for doing that. And it's lovely to see you. Uh, I imagine in Colorado, it's perhaps, is it one or two o'clock in the afternoon? It's eight, just after 8 p.m. here. Heidi Masson says hello. Hello, Heidi. Angel Barboni Smith says hello. Hello, Angel. Lovely to see you. Henry Paddy Shearman is saying hello. Hello, Henry. Kelly Sewell says hello. Hi, uh, Kelly. Kerem Gogus. Yay. Hello. Hello, Kerem. Hope you are well and everybody in Turkey is in good form. Barb Jordan. Hi, everyone. Happy to be here. And we are happy to have you here, Barb. Kit Cranog is watching. Hello, Kit. And how lucky are you to be in lockdown? 
uh, within two kilometers of the Cairns of Loch Crew. Huh? How did you get yourself into that position? Hmm? Did you plan it? <laughs> well done. Kira Lynch, greetings from myself, F Fair and Mary Jo from Cullen. Good evening to the Cullen folks in Conda Nalu. I presume you're all in, in the Louth part of Cullen. If you're not, we won't mention it. We won't hold it against you. Margaret Ring says hello, everyone. Hi, Margaret. Erica Rivertree, who is watching on both uh, platforms, apparently. Uh, greetings from Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, Laura Puente is uh, saying hello from the Windy City from Chicago. Two days in a row. I'm feeling blessed. Well, good for you, Laura. And I'm glad that you're feeling that way. Matt Devlin is in Orlando in Florida. My buddy Cody Fodor turned me on to all of your great content. Fantastic stuff. You are very welcome along, Matt. It's lovely to have you. Ta fall chirot. Jen Howell is saying hello from the Kawino Peninsula, Michigan, USA. Lovely stuff. And we have a number of states represented this evening. That's fantastic. Molly Michelle Kopeski says hello, Anthony, and all of the tour. Hello, Molly. You're very welcome. Catherine Wall McManus, well done on the article in the paper. Great acknowledgement and appreciation. Ah, that's nice. Adam Rory Porter is watching another fabulous photographer of Irish landscapes. You're very welcome along. And speaking of photographers, Matt Byrne, who's watching from Drogheda, is a keen wildlife photographer and knows a lot about birds. A very knowledgeable man. You're very welcome, Matt. Robert Arbuckle. Hello from the Oak City in the north. Hello, Robert from Derry. Jules Cousins is saying hi. Hi, Jules. You're welcome along. Tom Lawler said I'll give Facebook a go. See how the respecting is well done. Uh, County Tipperary. Hi, Tom. You're welcome along. Red Moonhead. Must be eight o'clock. It's mythical time. Brilliant. Francis Smith. Good write up in the Drogheda. Well, it was the Drogheda Independent. Uh, great work. Thanks, Slane. Yes, Francis. You're very welcome. From Balia Slánia. Uh, uh, in also in Glan Nabonia. Adam Rory Porter, good evening, sir. Gia Guch Makara from Angela and our three princesses from Bunkrana in Inishon, Kondi Dunangal. Thank you, sir. You're very welcome, Adam. Lovely to have you all along. Ma Magdalena Pasik is saying hello from Poland. Hello, Magdalena. You're so welcome. And Matt Byrne says, evening all. Wow. Okay, so a few things to say in terms of thanks before we roll on to the Druids. Uh, I want to say thanks to our new patrons. Uh, I'm always saying, you know, thanks to Mythical Ireland patrons who helped make all this happen. So just to give you an example, in the past number of days, I've had to renew the security uh, certificate on mythicalireland.com. And these are all things that patron your patronage helps to support. Uh, we would like to say hello to some new patrons, and they are Theresa Galloway, Demelza Noel, and Angela Smith. Thank you very much for becoming patrons of Mythical Ireland. You're very welcome, and I am very grateful to you. Don't forget, uh, if you're in Ireland, uh, in the next 10 minutes or 15 minutes, the pink super moon is going to rise now I, I as you know i've been an astronomer all my life i don't get too caught up in the whole super moon thing see the thing is that the moon doesn't follow a circular orbit around the earth it actually f has a uh um, orbits by their nature are a par parabolic in shape it's a parabola and what that means is there are times when the moon is closer to us and there's times when it's a little bit further away. When it's closest to us, everybody goes, super moon, right? Uh, it's not going to appear massively big. It's going to maybe be, you know, 8 to 10% larger than when it's at its furthest. So apogee is the furthest and perigee is the closest to Earth. So it's at one of its perigees. This is the closest full moon of the year. I'm not exactly sure why it's called the pink moon. But listen, don't go out rushing out to see it. If you if you do that, bring your phone with you so you can keep listening to the myths and watch the moon rise. It's a beautiful evening here. Uh, it's nice and clear. And I think that some of you are going to be treated to a lovely moon rise. And over the last uh, number of days, since about the third, you'd have seen my pictures. Uh, I was lucky enough at the end of each episode to be able to run out with my camera and take a picture of the evening star Venus among the Pleiades, the seven sisters. Well, it's racing away from the Pleiades now. Uh, so that is its once in eight year meeting with the Pleiades. I hope you enjoyed the photography. And just before we start, I'll just catch up because there's a few more 
people saying hello. Sharon Boggins Stitch is in Reading in California. Ta Falcha Roth. Uh, Sharon, you're very welcome along this evening. And uh, Slauncha. Brendan Kinch is in Cartagena from a deep sky imager. Brilliant stuff, Brendan. Hope you get some nice images. And I hope uh, you're not feeling too uh, isolated in the current situation. Daniel Welch says, hello all. Hello, Daniel. And uh, I gave you your good news today. So hopefully that will keep you happy and that will happen soon. Desiree Riley is in Louisiana. Can't wait for Mythflix tonight. Desiree, lovely to have you along. Daniel Welch, hello all, best wishes, Freya. Yay, druids. Uh, Catherine Wall McManus says, we can see the moon. She is beautiful. Fantastic. Yes, we're keeping an eye out for that. It's twilight here in Albion slash UK. Lovely stuff, Alex. You should see it before long. Kerem says, it's all cloudy here. Sky completely covered, so I can't see the super pink moon. Well, maybe, just maybe, when the live mitts is over, I'll finish and then I'll go live again to show you a quick view of the moon. Maybe. Let's see if we can make that happen. Erin Durrett has a load of moon phases in her comments. Fantastic. Declan Barron is in Conda Clar. You're very welcome, Declan from Clare. Lovely to see you in tonight. Amazing night skies at the moment, says Margaret. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we've had some great clear weather lately. We had a long, nasty, wet, cold, windy winter. So we're overdue some nice dry weather. It's just a pity that a lot of people are stuck indoors at the moment, but hopefully that won't last too long. Daniel says, yep, thanks very much for that. Looking forward to reading it. I must say one more word of thanks before we start. Teresa McGuinness is in Callaghan, Florida. Um, ah, okay. I see what's going on. Some people are watching on both. This is brilliant. Okay, fair enough. Henry... Southeast, I'm turned about. Lol. Good. Sorry, my nose is very itchy. Um, one more uh, word of thanks this evening. Live TV, what can you do? Is to my good wife, Anne, who helped me with my haircut today. I, I like it short. That's all I can say. And she did a fine job. Druidism. So we had an introduction to druids. And we're going to have another introduction to Druids. And even after we have our introduction to Druids, there will be one further episode soon so that we don't separate them too much. Uh, at least one more. And that will be about uh, Druids and magic. Uh, but there's lots and lots and lots and lots of material. So much to get through. And, and that's great. I mean, we're on episode 27 already. Can you believe we've been doing this for 27 uh, episodes in a row? Anyway, I'm going to get started. You're all huddled around the fire, dram in hand. Oh, by the way, if you have a fiddle or a, a penny whistle, you know, or a squeeze box, you know, play a tune to yourself while you're listening. Although Irish literature is full of allusions to the Druids, it is extremely difficult to know with any exactness what they were. They are mentioned from the earliest times. The pre-Milesian races, the Nemedians and Fomorians, had their druids who worked mutual spells against each other and, of course, were in the realm of mythology and the mythological cycle, all the way back to Lower Wall of the Book of Invasions, which we're going to do several episodes on in the not-too-distant future. So we're not necessarily dealing with history here. We're dealing with pseudo history or at least uh, mythical history as it's been recorded. I've got my bower on. Brilliant. Uh, Paul says no YouTube link tonight. Yes, we are on YouTube. No, no, definitely on YouTube. Yeah, I can see it there. I can hear it there. No, it's we are on we are on YouTube, so I'm not exactly sure uh, how you get the link. I think you have to be um, subscribed to the Mythical Ireland channel on YouTube to get the notifications. But if you just refresh the channel, it should be okay. But the feed looks to be okay, and it says excellent connection. Yvette, f forgive me, but please, what book? I'm reading tonight from A Literary History of Ireland by Douglas Bahija, or Douglas Hyde, who actually went on to become the first president of Ireland. And this is a fabulous book. And again, for the purposes of not breaching copyright and for what we call fair use, I'm reading sections of 
a book and I'm trying to change as much as possible so that I'm not relying on one particular book except for for instance in the case of the Lady Gregory book where uh, I'm pretty sure that's out of copyright so there wouldn't be an issue the Tua de Danon had innumerable druids among them who used magic the invading Milesians had three druids with them in their ships Aurgin or Amergin the poet and two others and again we'll be doing a, an episode entirely on its own on Amergin. In fact druids are mentioned in connection with all early Irish fiction and history from the first colonising of Ireland down to the time of the saints. It seems very doubtful however whether there existed in Ireland as definitely established an order of druids as in Britain and on the continent. Uh, Pat is up and running on Facebook. Hello, Pat. I wonder were there problems with the YouTube feed? Uh, I, I see comments. My YouTube not coming through. That's very strange. I can see the feed here. It's very strange. I apologise. I mean, I, I did tests to try and sort out all the issues. And here we go again. Other issues with Facebook. But sure, what can you do? Anyway, we'll carry on. Some of you, thankfully, have migrated from Fa from YouTube over to Facebook. Uh, Tracy says, Evening all from Balia Brigine, Balbriggan in County Dublin, just down the road from us. You're very welcome, Tracy. Laura Adomitroy says, Good evening from a silent and chilly Blessington. You're very welcome, Laura. OK, so there are problems again with the YouTube feed. I can see it here, but yet several of you are not. OK, I see. I see it's prompting me to go live again. So I, perhaps there was an issue. I apologize about that. So uh, just for the for the YouTube listeners, uh, I do apologize. There seems to have been an interruption in the feed. Hopefully it's up and running again. Uh, my sincerest apologies for that. Anyway. There are frequently mentioned in Irish literature, sorry, they are, as in the Druids, as ambassadors, spokesmen, teachers and tutors. What's the difference between a teacher and a tutor? Interesting. Kings were sometimes Druids, so were poets. It is a word which seems to me to have been, perhaps from the first, used with great laxity and great latitude. The Druids, so far as we can ascertain, do not seem to be connected with any positive rites or worship. Still less do they appear to have been a regular priesthood, and there is not a shadow of evidence to connect them with any special worship as that of the sun or the fire. Tracy says, just checked it. Yes, it's up and running again. Uh, and just going to restore the chat as well. Uh, so I do uh, apologise to every everybody. I have no idea what the problem was this time. It may just have been something as simple as me not properly clicking the, the go live button. You know, I have to click the start streaming button on the software and then the, the go live button on YouTube. So I apologise. I apologise for that. On uh, Katrina says, teacher is more qualified. Yes, in the modern sense. Oh, the sound is off. Okay. Is it off or is it just really quiet? It was very loud earlier. Melza Lanine on YouTube says, Hello, hello Melza, you're very welcome along. Desiree Riley says, YouTube is up now. Hopefully everything is okay. I only got a notification just now for YouTube nearly 10 minutes into live stream, so defo problem. Okay, can hear you, but it's a bit muffled. Okay, oh, sorry folks. Look, Facebook has been thoroughly reliable in all this. YouTube, not so much. So, in the oldest saga cycle, the druid appears as a man of the highest rank and related to kings. King Connor's father was, according to some, probably the oldest accounts a druid. So was Finn McCool's grandfather. 
Irish technical thinker says greetings from Belfast, Ireland. Could you say hello to Rachel for working so hard today from home? She's an accountant and working from home, but she enjoys watching these with me. Marcus from Belfast. Hello, Marcus. And hello, Rachel. And yeah, of course, uh, we're very happy to say hello. I'm glad to hear that you're enjoying uh, the live Irish myths and hopefully it's given you a little bit of a break from your work. Um, and uh, welcome along. Grab a stool and grab a drink. The audio is perfect, but it's a little sensitive. Yeah, it's in the red there. That's why I did have to pull it down earlier. One, two, one, two, one, two. Okay, it's not clipping there now. I have to monitor these things. Sorry, folks, for the technical stuff. You know, maybe after this is over, um, hopefully, I mean the COVID-19 situation, um, hopefully uh, Live Irish Myths will continue to be a regular thing. And hopefully I'll be able to get some technical support i'm not that good with this sort of thing you know um this is the first time i've ever used this software was when i started doing this uh, live irish mints it's easy to go live on the on facebook on the phone it's so easy it's so you just set it up and you press a button and, and type a thing and and go and, and everything works on youtube it's a little bit different anyway not to worry irish technical thinker says perfect audio okay good 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 we haven't gone very far. We've only read two paragraphs. So not to worry. You haven't missed much. Bev Lethbridge says, Hi, Anthony from Canada. Hi, Bev, one of Mythical Ireland's great fans. She's even got the top fan badge. Thanks, Bev, and you're welcome. Before the coming of St. Patrick, there certainly existed images, or as they're called by the ancient authorities, idols in Ireland, at which or to which sacrifice used to be offered, probably with a view to propici propitiating the earth gods, possibly the Tua de Danon, and securing good harvests and abundant kine. Paul Garron says weekly rather than daily. Yeah, perhaps, maybe even twice weekly. Who knows? But sure, for the moment, we're doing them every day anyway, ain't sure. We'll see how it goes. Shamey McCarville says, hello, hi, Shamey, you're very we welcome along this evening. Irish technical thinker, I am supporting your channel by telling everyone. Well, I'm very grateful for that. Thank you very much. Yeah, there were problems with the with the audio. It seems to be OK now on YouTube, that is. Yeah, so this idea of securing good harvests on abundant kind from the Tua de Danon. From sacrificial rites spring, almost of necessity, a sacrificial caste. And this caste, the Druids, had arrived at a high state of organisation of Gaul in Gaul and Britain when observed by Caesar, and did not hesitate to sacrifice whole hecatombs of human beings. They think, said Caesar, that unless a man's life is rendered up for a man's life, the will of the immortal God cannot be satisfied, and they have sacrifices of this kind as a national institution. Caesar's words, this is from a footnote, Caesar's words are worth repeating. He says that there were two sorts of men in Gaul, both numerous and honoured, the knights and the druids, because the people counted for nothing and took the initiative in nothing. As for the druids, he says, and the rest is in Latin, let's get the translation, Oh, it's not translated, is it? Oh, anybody know Latin? I'm not very good at Latin. Rebus divinus intersunt sacrificia pub publica et privita procurant religiones interprantur, etc., etc. All this seems very like the duties of the Irish druids, but not what follows. Si qui aut privatus aut populus iorum decreto non stetit sacrificius. Oh, yeah, never mind. I wonder how many uh, Latin uh, scholars we have. The Christian brothers, once upon a time, used to teach Latin as a school subject. But by the time I, I, I got into school, uh, it wasn't happening. OK, I need to turn down the uh, the YouTube audio just slightly again. By the looks of it, it's uh, again over modulating. OK, thanks for that. There appears nothing, however, that I am aware of to connect the Druids in Ireland with human sacrifice, although such sacrifice appears to have been offered. The Druids, however, appear to have had private idols of their own. We find a very minute account in the 10th century glossary of King Cormac as to how a poet performed incantations with his idols. 
The word poet is here apparently equivalent to druid, as the word druid, like the Latin vates, is frequently a synonym for poet. Here is how the glossary explains the incantation called Imbas Forosni. This, says the ancient lexicographer, describes to the poet whatsoever thing he wishes to discover, and this is the manner in which it is performed. The poet chews a bit of the raw red flesh of a pig, a dog or a cat, and then retires with it to his own bed behind the door, where he pronounces an oration over it and offers it to his idol gods. He then invokes the idols, and if he has not received the illumination before the next day, he pronounces incantations upon his two palms and takes his idol gods unto him into his bed in order that he may not be interrupted in his sleep. He then places his two hands upon his two cheeks and falls asleep. He is then watched so that he be not stirred nor interrupted by any one until everything that he seeks be revealed to him at the end of a nomad. And that, uh, there's a footnote for, uh, O'Curry translates this as a day. Or two, or three, or as long as he continues at his offering. And hence it is that this ceremony is called imbus, that is, the two hands upon him crosswise, that is, a hand over and a hand hither upon his cheeks. And St. Patrick prohibited this, this ceremony because it is a species of chenum leida, uh, another species of incantation mentioned in the glossary. That is, he declared that anyone who performed it should have no place in heaven or on earth. These were apparently the private images of the Druid himself which are spoken of, but there certainly existed public idols in Ireland before, in pagan Ireland, before the evangelization of the island. St. Patrick himself, in his confession, asserts that before his coming the Irish worshipped idols, Idola et Imunda, pardon me, and we have preserved to us more than one account of the great gold covered image, and we mentioned this in the episode, I think it was 24, about Crom Dove and Crom Croak, a great gold covered image which was set up in Moist Slot, i.e., the plain of adoration, believed to have been in the present county of Cavan. It stood there surrounded by twelve lesser idols ornamented with brass and may possibly have been regarded as a sun god ruling over the twelve seasons. It was called the Crum Croak or Ken Croak and certain Irish tribes considered it their special tutelary deity. Uh, what does tutelary mean? It's a guardian, isn't it? Guardian of the, the country or the landscape. The Dinshanicus or, or explanation of the name Moislaut calls it the king idol of Aaron, and around him were twelve idols made of stones, but he was of gold. Until Patrick's advent, he was the god of every folk that colonised Ireland. To him they used to offer the firstlings of every issue, and the chief scions of every clan, and the ancient poem in the Book of Leinster declares that it was, quote, a high idol with many fights, which was named the Crum Croic, unquote. The poem tells us that the brave Gaels used to worship it and would never ask from its satisfaction as to their portion of the hard work without paying it tribute. Now I see there's lots of... It's uh, a little bit raspy. Okay, so we'll, we'll just nudge it down a little bit more and just speak up a little bit so it's not... It doesn't seem to be clipping. Crom Cruach, yay. Margaret Ring, Nook on you. Limerick's Newgrange and Tara, I am told, yes. Silve, uh, the last audio reduction has brought it into clear parameters, but still a little bit raspy. Okay, yeah, we've just brought it again down. I do apologise for the technical hitches. Yeah, the thing about the, the chewing of the flesh um, is present in the story of uh, Conor Amor, uh, the great king of Tara, you know, and the bull feast. I, I'm always very hesitant about, you know, what we were talking about in previous episodes about history being written by the victor. I'm always very careful when we see this 
it pronounces an oration over it and offers it to his idol gods. I and mean, once you see the word idol and once you see the word pagan, you assume that these have been written by uh, Christian scribes who who are not at all comfortable with what they are describing. Audio is perfect apparently now, so that's good news. Um, so we have to sort of always take it with a pinch of salt when it's written by uh, a Christian monk uh, who, who has uh, an obvious bias against uh, what he's writing about, you know. Hi from Belfast. Antona o Kim Quivenach. You're very welcome. Ta Faltero. Declan Baron says hello. Mensa, 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 Mensa. And Mandy McCurl says hello from the Hebrides. You're very welcome along. Vicky Highland says this is extremely off. Hmm. Was that the audio? I hope it's okay now. Paul Garron, Latin, county tip. <laughs> Margaret did Latin up to intercert. <laughs> okay, right. Good. What is Druid in Irish? Dri. Uh, yeah, we did discuss that the other night though, didn't we? Is there even an Irish word for Druid? You know? I'm just looking at the footnotes to make sure there's nothing there that we should be reading. In O'Donovan's frag fragmentary manuscript catalogue of the Irish manuscripts in Trinity College, Dublin, he writes apropos of the life of St. Myog or Moog contained in blah, 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 H26. I searched the two brethnies for the situation of Moyslacht on which stood the chief pagan Irish idol, Crom Cruick, but have failed being misled by Lanigan, who had been misled by Seward, who had been blinded by the impostor Beaufort, who placed this plane in the county of Leitrim. It can, however, be proved from this life of St. Moog that Mog Schlecht was that level part of the barony of Tullahan in the county of Cavan, in which the island of Inish Brag Brawy, or Bragwy, now Moog's Island, the Church of Templeport and the little village of Ballymagarran are situated. I have been told that O'Donovan afterwards found reason to doubt the correctness of this identification. And in relation to uh, uh, Crum Croak, yeah, Crum Croak, M. de Jubainville connects the name with Cru, Latin, Cruor, blood, translating Ken Croak by Tet Sanglante, Sanglante is it? And Crom Crook by Curba Sanglante or Croissant en Sanglante but Reese connects it with Crook a reek or mound as in Krog Patrick that makes sense St. Patrick's reek. Ken Crook is evidently the same name as the Roman station Penno Crucium in the present county of Stafford the Irish Sea being as usual the equivalent of the British P. This would appear to uh, this would make it appear that Crum was no local idol Reese thinks it got its name Crum Crook, the stooped one of the mound from the bent attitude in the days of its decadence. And there you go. And here is uh, the ancient poem from the Book of Leinster. He was their god, the withered crumb with many mists, the people whom he shook over every harbour, the everlasting kingdom they shall not have. To him without glory would they kill their piteous wailing offspring with much wailing and peril, to pour their blood around Crum Cruick. Milk and corn they would ask from him speedily, in return for one third of their healthy issue. Great was the horror and scare of him. To him noble gales would prostrate themselves. From, from the worship of him, with many manslaughters, the plain is called Moy Schlacht. In their ranks stood four times three stone idols. To bitterly beguile the hosts, the figure of Crum was made of gold. Since the rule of Eremon, the noble man of grace, there was worshipping of stones until the coming of good Patrick of Macha, and that is, of course, uh, Ardma, uh, and that is, of course, St. Patrick. This, there is not the slightest reason to distrust this evidence as far as the ev existence of Crum Cruick goes. This particular tradition, says Mr. Nutt, like the majority of those contained in it, the Dinshanicus, must be of pre-Christian origin. It would have been quite impossible for a Christian monk to have invented such a story, and we may accept it as a perfectly genuine bit of information respecting the ritual side of insular Celtic religion. So there you go. Despite uh, the bias of 
uh, or the subjectivity of the of the scribes towards the material they still recorded it the moon is beautiful look outside oh my god it's beautiful okay um i can't so i'll have to look at it uh, when i'm finished <laughs> and hopefully we'll be able to broadcast it live one druid who has fascinated me is Kopad. To be present at such incredible le legends as Cuchulain and Deirdre was a big reason why I started reading about the Irish druids. Magical. And that is from Vicky Highlands. Only thing I've got on Crumb was El Sprague Deck Camp made him Conan the Barbarian's patron god. Interesting. Monique says, I feel like I'm back to college. So nice to hear your words. Well, these are the words of a very, very learned gentleman who uh, is, is long dead now, but uh, who uh, who uh, became the first president of Ireland. Uh, Fur Solo Fur says, hello from Mexico. Oh, wow. Uh, very good evening. So uh, hopefully some of you are getting the opportunity to go out and look uh, at the moon no mention of them as astronomers Aaron we will get to that see what I said about there will be several episodes about the druids there's lots uh, in uh, especially in Bonwick's book uh, there's lots about the druids so yes we will proceed don't worry don't worry we'll get there absolutely Saint Patrick overthrew this idol according both to the poem in the book of Leinster and the early lives of the saint a classic example of history being written by the victor the life says that when St. Patrick caused Crum, cursed Crum, the ground opened and swallowed up the twelve lesser idols as far as their heads, which, as Rhys acutely observes, shows that when the early lives of the saint were written, the pagan sanctuary had so fallen into decay that only the heads of the lesser idols abo remained above ground. While he thinks that it was at this time from its bent attitude and decayed appearance, the idol was called Crum the Stupor. There is, however, no apparent or recorded connection between this idol and the Druids, nor do the Druids appear to have fulfilled the functions of a public priesthood in Ireland. And the introduction, in the, and the introduction to the Shenkus Moor, or the ancient Book of Brehan Laws, distinctly says that, quote, Until Patrick came, only three classes of persons were permitted to speak in public in Erin. A chronicler to relate events and to tell stories, a poet to eulogise and to satirise, and a brehan to pass sentence from precedents and commentaries, thus noticeably omitting, omitting all mention of the Druids as a public body. Fascinating stuff. And I must backtrack a little bit because we should read the poem another one. The details of this idol and above all in con the connection in which it stands in to the mythic culture king Tiernmas Tiern could not, as Mr. Note well remarks, have been invented by a Christian monk. But nothing is more likely, it appears to me, that, than that such a one, familiar with the idol rites of Judea from the Old Testament, may have added the embellishing trait of the sacrifice of the firstlings of every issue. So here we have a suggestion that, in fact, the sacrifice was added by one of the scribes who was familiar with the Old Testament. Sir Samuel Ferguson's admirable poem upon the death of Cormac refers to the priests of the idol, but there is no recorded evidence of any such priesthood. Crum Croak and his sub-gods twelve, saith Cormac, are but carven treen. The axe that made them haft or helve had worthier of your worship been. But he who made the tree to grow and hid in earth and iron stone and made the man with mind to know the axe's use is God's alone. And none to priests of Crum were brought, where girded in their service dread, they ministered in red moishlocht, words, word of the words, King Cormac said. They loosed their curse against the king, they cursed him in his flesh and bones, and daily in their mystic ring they turned the maledictive stones. <laughs> oh, how very thoroughly romantic. Kieran McHugh says, just joining... We'll watch from the start, thanks. Anyone else just envision the heads on Easter Island when the idols were swallowed by the ground? Interesting idea, Vicky. Fantastic. The idol crumb with his 12 sub subordinates may very well have represented the sun upon whom both season and crops and consequently the life both of man and beast depend. I'm beginning to think that perhaps it was the case that there's nothing so arcane and mysterious about uh, pre-Christian practices. 
uh, that some of the mystique was added afterwards, uh, long removed from the fact and long removed from the practices uh, that such things were imagined as, you know, human sacrifice and all this, that and the other and the dread of Crom Croic. Perhaps it wasn't that at all. Perhaps, uh, uh, as has been suggested elsewhere, Crom Croic was uh, made of a, a, a rick of, of corn uh, and, and was an offering, you know, uh, for a bountiful harvest, you know, who knows. Uh, Stephen Rahman, right click the speaker icon on the bottom of your task, open for takedown microphone input level. Okay, apparently we're still having uh, issues. Uh, I'm going to lower it a little bit more. Hopefully that will do it. The gods to whom the early Irish seem to have sacrificed were no doubt, as I think Mr. Nutt has shown, agricultural powers, the lords of life and growth. And with these, the sun, who was at the root of all growth, was intimately connected. The object of that worship was to promote increase. The theory of worship was life for life. That the Irish swore by the sun and the moon and the elements is certain. The oath is quoted in many places and St. Patrick appears to allude to sun worship in that pes passage on his confession where he says, quote, that sun which we see rising daily at his bidding for our sake, it will never rain and its splendour will not last forever. But those who adore it will perish miserably for all eternity. This is also borne out by the passage in Cormac's glossary of the images and the images the pagans used to adore as for instance the form or figure of the sun on the altar and i'm always very cautious when i'm reading from a christian source about pre-christian practices so don't take it uh, as read always take it with at least uh, a, a pinch of salt Darcy McGee always ref also refers to Crom Croak in terms almost equally poetic, but equally unauthorised. Their ocean god was Mananon MacLear, whose angry lips in their white foam full would often inter whole fleets of ships. Crom was their day god and their thunderer, made morning and eclipse. Bride was their queen of song, and unto her they prayed with fire-touched lips. Fantastic stuff. Another phrase of the druidic character seems to have been that he was looked upon as an intermediary between man and the invisible powers. In the story which tells us how Mir the Daedanon carries off the king's wife, we are informed that the druid's council, and of course that's from Tochmark Eitain, the druid's council is sought as to how to recover her, which he at last is enabled to do, quote, through his keys of science and ohm unquote, after a year's searching. So we've touched on a little bit uh, of uh, the uh, astronomical import that the Irish swore on the sun and moon. Making me think of corn dollies the gypsy sold door to door when I was getting exactly the same thing, Henry, exactly the same thing. And you see pictures of, uh, sometimes she's called the Kolyak, you know, uh, and she's made of that uh, stand of corn or, you know, uh, that little bit of gathered wheat and tied together in a certain way to look like, almost look like a person. But you see those pictures from a, even a couple of two or three generations ago, maybe from the first part of the 20th century. I've seen them online. Um, Michael Fortune's uh, folklore.ie uh, website and, and Facebook page is very good for that sort of thing. Uh, if you haven't come across Michael's work, please definitely do yourself a favour and look him up. The Druids are represented as carrying wands of you. Now, we did meet that in the Bonwick book in the first uh, episode on Druids. But there is nothing in Irish literature, so far as I'm aware of, about their connection with the oak from the Greek for which they are popularly supposed to derive their name. They used to be consulted as soothsayers upon the probable succession, sorry, success of expeditions, as by Cormac MacArt when he was thinking about exhorting a double tribute from Munster, and by Dahi, the last pagan king of Ireland, when setting up out upon his expedition abroad, they took auguries by birds, they could cause magic showers and fires, they observed stars and clouds, which makes them astronomers and meteorologists, and told lucky days. And they had ordeals of their own, but above all, they appear to have been tutors or teachers. So 
we're getting the impression that they're knowledgeable, but their primary function is as teachers rather than magicians. And so just in relation to those lucky days, there's a footnote. Kotbad, who's, who's somebody's favourite druid, Kotbad, Conor McNessa's druid, foretold that anyone who took arms, the Irish equivalent for knighthood, upon a certain day would become famous forever, but would enjoy only a brief life. It was Cucullan who assumed arms upon that day. And I think we did come across that, didn't we? Was that in the episode about Skahawk? You know? I'm not sure. Another druidic practice which is mentioned in Cormac's glossary is f more fully treated of by Keating in his account of the great pagan convention at Ishnach, a hill in Meath. Actually, it's in West Meath. Where the men of Ireland, it, it was in Meath, yes, but it's in county, modern West Meath, where the men of Ireland were wont to exchange their goods and their wares and other jewels. And here again, <coughs> pardon me, we have uh, perhaps reference to an Enoch, uh, an assembly. And we were talking about Enochs just last night in relation specifically to Enoch in Broga and Dronehenge and the Great Henge Monuments, the late Neolithic uh, assemblage uh, of Brunebonia. This convention was held in the month of May. Quote, and at it they were wont to make sacrifice to the arch god whom they adored, whose name was Baal, B E Father L. And you'll find that Baal uh, is a uh, troublesome uh, from the point of view from a scholarly point of view because it's very very little about Baal um, they're likely to have adored a sun deity we've seen that sun deity in the form of Dagda we've seen it possibly in the form of Lu uh, we may as we suggested have uh, have seen St. Patrick coming in and taking over some of that mythology but Baal is a troublesome one it was likewise their usage to light two fires at Baal in every district in Ireland at this season and to drive a pair of each herd of cattle that the district contained between these two fires as a preservative to guard them against all the diseases of that year. It is from that fire thus made that the day on which the noble feast of the apostles Peter and James is held has been called Bealtaine, Bealtaine in Scottish Bealtaine, i.e. Baal's fire. Pardon me. <coughs> And we'll take a sup of the old water. Rowan Grove says, Cuchulain and Achilles had similar at attitudes. Yeah, and we'll be getting on to Cuchulain soon. We'll be starting with uh, the birth of Cuchulain and the boyhood deeds of Cuchulain before we read the time. Uh, 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 Katrina says, near Mullingar, Hup. Yeah, absolutely is right. Uh, the wonderful, wonderful hill of Ishnach. Cormac, however, says nothing about a god named Baal, and I'm not surprised because very few people do, who indeed is only once mentioned elsewhere, as far as I know, but explains the name as if it were Biltene, goodly fire, which from the fires, sorry, from the fires which the Druids made on that day through which to drive the cattle. And of course, that uh, ritual was called Iger Naga Chine, which means between the two fires. And somebody else has just quoted Katrina. Idrigatina Baltina. Yeah, exactly. Now, here's, here's a footnote uh, that's worth reading. The Christian priests, apparently unable to abolish these cattle ceremonies, unable to abolish. You remember what we've been saying in, in, in certain episodes. People are saying, oh, the Christians did this and that and they destroyed Irish culture and they destroyed mythology and they destroyed. No, they didn't. In fact, they had trouble stamping it out. The Christian priests, apparently unable to abolish these cattle ceremonies, took the harm out of them by transferring them to St. John's Eve, the 24th of June, where there are still observed in most districts of Ireland the large fires built with bones in them, and occasionally cattle are driven through them or people leap over them. The cattle were probably driven through the fire as a kind of substitute for their sacrifice and the bones burnt in the fire are probably a substitute for the bones of the cattle that should have been offered up. Hence the fires are called Chena Knov, bone fire in Irish and bone fire, not bonfire in English. So there you go. Always be very, very careful if you're reading about pre-Christian uh, traditions 
uh, and festivities and rituals when it has been written down by a Christian monk. Post-Christian accounts of the Druids as a whole and or individual Druids differ widely. The notes on St. Patrick in the Book of Armagh present them in the worst possible light as wicked wizards and augurs and people of incantations and the Latin lives of the saints nearly always call them magi, M-A-G-I. So there, there we go. What more need we say except for always take that pinch of salt and if you haven't got a pinch of salt, take a bucket instead. They, yet they are admitted to have been able to prophesy. King Lera's druids prophesied to him three years before the arrival of St. Patrick that, quote, Adze heads would come over a furious sea, their mantles whole-headed, their staves crooked-headed, their tables in the east of their houses, unquote. In the lives of the early saints, we find some of them on fair terms with the druids. Columkill's first teacher was a druid whom his mother consulted about him. It is true that in the Lismore text he is called not a druid but a fai, fa fada i d h i e vates or prophet. But this only confirms the close connection between druid, prophet, and teacher, for his proceedings are distinctly druidical. The account runs, and I'm going to read that now, just after I make a little mark there. Quote, now when the time for reading came to him, the cleric went to a certain prophet who abode in the land to ask him what the boy ought, to, sorry, ask him when the, when the boy ought to begin. When the prophet had scanned the sky, he said, quote, write an, alpha, an alphabet for him now, unquote. The alphabet was written on a cake and column kill consumed the cake in this wise half to the east of a water and half to the west of a water. So said the prophet through grace of prophecy, quote, So shall this child's territory be, half to the east of the sea and half to the west of the sea, unquote. Column Kill himself is said to have composed a poem beginning, quote, My druid is the son of God, unquote. And that is not lovely. Uh, you know, I like that. Another druid prophesies prophecies of St. Bridget before she was born. And other instances connecting the early saints with druids are said to be found in their lives, which at least show that there existed a sufficient number of persons in early Christian Ireland who did not consider the druids wholly bad, but believed that they could prophesy at least in the interests of the saints. Uh, uh, Katrina says faith f-e-i-t-h no uh, is that the same uh, f-a-fada i-d-h f-a-fada i-d-h is the word here Katrina so I'm not sure if it's the same as f-e-i-t-h perhaps it is perhaps it's a, a an old uh, an older Irish rendering of it uh, perhaps you might just comment on that thanks thanks for your intervention by the way Eric Duhan is watching hi Eric Bonsoir, mon ami. Hope you are keeping well and that you are not uh, uh, isolated in a bad way and that you're keeping in touch with everybody. I've been watching some of your cooking uh, lessons and by God, all I can say is you are domesticated. From what we have said, it is evidence that there were always druids in Ireland and that they were personages of great importance. But it is not clear that they were an organised body like the Druids of Gaul or like the Bardic body in later times in Ireland. Nor is it clear what their exact functions were, but they seem to have been teachers above everything else. It is clear too that the ancient Irish, at least in some cases, possessed and worshipped images. Of course they did. But should we see those images, don't we, in the stone sites? Yep. Foy, seer, prophet. Ar a harshak fein. No man is a prophet. Far in a duchus, ar a harshak fein. No man is a prophet in his own country. Uh, and a second explanation for foy is wise man or sage. And a three plural fates. Yeah. Wise man, sage. 
profit. Interesting. If you're on a high point, asks Catherine, can you not see the sun and the full moon at the same time? You can see the almost full moon and the sun in the sky at the same time. The reason you shouldn't see the 100% illuminated moon and the sun in the sky at the same time is because they are diametrically opposite. But there is a lensing effect also of the Earth's atmosphere when they're at the horizon. So when you first see the sun rising or setting or last see the sun setting and first see the moon rising, you're not seeing them in their actual real positions. But yesterday was the day upon which you should have been able to see a 98% illuminated moon uh, rising while the sun was setting on the opposite side of the sky, but not on the day of... Uh, not on the day of full full moon rise twin fires in the sky perhaps these moments is the time open for magic the bonfires thus become a small version found in the sky absolutely catherine and there is some symbolism there in relation to uh the paschal fire of patrick at slain and why he was drawing the king's eyes towards the fire and what constellation was behind the fire when he loaded when he when he uh, lit it from what we have said it is evidence that there were always druids in ireland but it's not clear that they were an organised body. It is clear too that the ancient Irish, at least in some cases, possessed and worshipped images. That they sacrificed to them and even offered up human beings is by no means so certain. The evidence for this resting upon the single passage in the Dinshanicus and the poem in a modern style of metre in the Book of Leinster, which we have just given, and which, though it is evidence for the existence of the idol Crum Croak, known to us already from other sources, may possibly have had the trait of human sacrifice added as a heightening touch by a Christian chronicler familiar with the accounts of Moloch and Astaroth. Ashtaroth. The complete silence which, outside of these passages, exists in all Irish literature as to a pro proceeding so terrifying to the popular imagination, seems to me proof that if human sacrifice was ever restored to uh, resorted to at all it had fallen into abeyance before the landing of the christian mister, mi missionaries and they are the very wise words of douglas uh, douglas hyde Doug douglas the hege and there is one note here in relation to the the silence outside of these passages there is one other instance of human sacrifice mentioned in the book of ballymote but this is recorded in connection with funeral games and appears to have been an isolated piece of barbarity performed, quote, that it might be a reproach to the Mammonians forever, and that it might be a trophy over them, unquote. Theacra, a brother of Nile of the Nine hostages in the 4th century, carried off 50 hostages from Munster, and dying of his wounds, the hostages were buried alive with him round his grave. For another allusion to human sacrifice, see O'Curry's Manners and Customs, Volume I, page DCXLI, and blah blah blah. The Dinshenicus quoted from above is a topographical work explaining the origin of Irish place names and attribute, attributed to Amergan MacAulgy, poet to the King Jermud MacArwell, who lived in the 6th century. There seems no reason, says Dr. Atkinson in his preface to the facsimile Book of Leinster, for disputing his claims to be regarded as the original compiler of a work of a similar character. The original nucleus is now not now determinable. determinable. The oldest copy is the Book of Leinster and treats of nearly 200 places and contains 88 poems. And of course, we're going to be doing more from the Dinshanica soon. The copy in the Book of Ballymote contains 139 and that in the Book of Lecan even more. The total number of all the poems contained in the different copies is close on 170. The copy in the Bodleian Library was published by Whitley Stokes in Folklore, December 1892. And that in the Advocates Library in Edinburgh in Folklore, December 1893. The prose tales from a copy at Rennes, he published in the Revue Celtique, volumes uh, 15 and 16. An edition of the oldest copy of the Book of Leinster is still at Desir Desideratum. It's still desirable, I presume. The whole work is full of interesting pagan allusions, but the different copies in the case of many names vary greatly and even contradict each other. What a surprise, huh? myths contradicting each other and i'm going to read just one small amount more uh, from 
uh, Bonwick. But we will be returning to the subject of druids. Uh, we'll be returning to druids and magic, and we'll be returning to druids and astronomy, particularly in relation to the sun. Uh, and we may be able to expand uh, on those. Help the non-Irish speakers understand, please. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and when we read Irish, I, I, I have to remind myself when I do read Irish to also translate immediately into English. And uh, my apologies about that. It is not surprising that Dr. Ritchie, in his short essay on the Irish people, sorry, short history of the Irish people, should write, as to what Druidism was, either in speculation or practice, we have very little information. As far as we can conjecture, the religion must have consist consisted of tribal divinities and local rites. As to the Druids themselves, we have no distinct information. He is not astonished that authors are now found to deny the existence of Druids altogether. He admits that, at the reputed time of St. Patrick, the Druids, quote, seem to be nothing more than the local priests or magicians attached to the several tribal chiefs, perhaps not better than the medicine men of the North American Indians. And we did read that the other night, uh, as if that was a derogatory thing to say. In fact, uh, the medicine men were highly revered uh, uh, people in the tribes of North America. As that period was prior to the earliest assumed for the Welsh Talisin, one is at a loss to account for the great difference between these two peoples, then so closely associated in intercourse. The opinion of the Abel O'Byrne Crow is thus expressed. Quote, After the introduction of our Irish irregular system of Druidism, which must have been about the second century of the Christian era, era the Phileas bards uh, and had to fall into something like the position of the British bards. But let us examine our older compositions, pieces which have been which have about them intrinsic marks of authenticity and we shall be astonished to see what a delicate figure the druid makes in them on the supposition that druidism had not time for development before the arrival of the saint he accounts for the easy conversion of ireland to christianity it is singular that Talisin should mention the sun as being sent in a coracle from cardigan bay to arkle or arklo in ireland this leads Mor Morian to note that, quote, the solar drama performed in the neighbourhood of Borth, Wales and Arklo, Ireland, unquote. Arthur Clive thought it not improbable that Ireland and not Britain, as Caesar supposed, was the source of Gaulish Druidism. Anglesey, says he, would be the most natural si site for the British Druidical College. This suspicion once raised, the parallel case of St. Colum Kill occupying Iona with his Irish monks and priests when he went upon his missionary expedition to the Picts, occurs to the mind. Assuredly, Iona was a sacred place of the Druids uh, when he went upon his, sorry, uh, and hence the likeness of the Kuldees to the older tenants of the Isle. Clive believed the civilization of Ireland was not due to the Celt, but to the darker race before them. I don't know what he means by darker exactly, but he is actually right, uh, because Ireland was, was already ancient long before the Celts. In Druidism, he saw little of a Celtic character, quote, and that all of what was noble and good contained in the institution was in some way derived from southern and Euscarian sources, unquote. May not the same be said of Wales? There the true Welsh, those of the south and southeast, are certainly not the light Celt, but the dark Iberian, like to the darker Bretons and northern Spaniards. Fascinating stuff. We will return. Oh, we'll read one bit more. In Ireland, and this is the learned John Toland from Derry. In Ireland, said he of the Druids, quote, they had the privilege of wearing six colours in their brechons or robes, which are the striped breque of the Gauls, and that sounds like the Irish brack, meaning speckled, doesn't it? Still worn by the Highlanders, whereas the king and queen might have in theirs but seven, lords and ladies five, etc. He had no doubts of their sun worship, and of Abaris, the druid friend of Pythagoras, being from his own quarters. While he thought the Greeks borrowed from the northern druids, he admitted that both may have learned from the older Egyptians. Wow, and we really are actually still only touching on a very uh, obscure subject because uh, as Hyde, who was a great scholar uh, of Irish history and uh, myth and, and legend and lore, um, there is so little said about Druids. And a l most of what is said uh, is said by Christian uh, chroniclers and scribes. 
And there is a difficulty there because of the subjective nature of their approach. Um, that what aspects uh, are the genuine tradition and which are uh, superimposed or uh, um, uh, supposed uh, by the uh, said uh, Christian scribes. So try and disentangle it a little bit is interesting. Beyond that, you just have to look into the core of mythology itself to the older stories. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, just thinking about the local myths here uh, about Brunavonia, Tuchmark Etain, uh, in which Elkmar appears very druidic in form, standing on Newgrange with a, a garb about him and holding a fork of white hazel, which is a rod of divination it is an instrument of divination not a scepter or a sword which is sort of what you might think is the more traditional symbol of kingship and also the story of Bresal Bodibad and his sister at uh, Douth where we are told that strongly she makes her druid spell she casts a spell on the sun so that it stands in one spot so that it is it is motionless above her head and so when you look at aspects of mythology you see threads that perhaps you can disentangle uh, again with some subjectivity and it's very difficult to say for certain whether you know there ever were such things as druids but also when you sit down as i have done on many occasions in front of stones at nouth and that's going to be another episode uh, and you look at a stone and you see what appear to be calculations of the lunar cycles and you say to yourself okay so somebody had this stuff figured out 5000 years ago or, or so 5300 years ago and so that somebody has carved or instructed an artist to carve these symbols onto the stone but why if this is arcane knowledge, then why write it down? It's being written down to memorialise it and also to act as a sort of a Neolithic prehistoric blackboard uh, or chalkboard. This is where I imagine, and this is imagination, of course, and speculation. Absolutely it is. Uh, where you can imagine a druid, an astronomer, seer, poet, wise person, sat down with pupils those in the community who were younger and didn't have the same knowledge but who needed to know this knowledge in order to become fully fledged druids at some later stage so in other words were some of these stones uh, uh, the the locations of uh, druid schools where the information uh, arcane sacred uh, transcendent in some cases related to other worlds it was uh, trans transcribed was um, taught was tutored to uh, younger um, initiates uh, and that is a question of course which we can't answer you know was it a dowsing rod H henry you may have missed because we did speak about this in previous episodes but uh, in my book, Mythical Ireland, New Light on the Ancient Past, I have a chapter about that story about Elkmar. And I do think it's a, a divining, a dowsing rod. Uh, uh, in fact, there was a spring uh, at Newgrange that flowed out from between two of the passage stones in the passageway, which I have no doubt was actually incorporated into the structure of Newgrange. So I think that water was fundamental to uh, the uh, important uh, uh, the, to the importance of the structure Julius Caesar mentioned them in the Gallic Wars he talks about their role as a priesthood with judicial and educational functions apparently he knew one well and brought him to Rome and Cairo Cicero sorry and Cicero mentions meeting him yeah that's from Daniel Welsh exactly I don't think they were bar as barbaric uh, I think that the whole the whole human sacrifice thing it, it, it almost reminds me of one of those uh, urban myth kind of things spread uh, as a derogatory uh, device uh, against the druids you know and it may not have had much substance to it at all Catherine Woodruff wasn't there a special thing about May babies children born in May or you brought your new children out to be seen by the community in May that may have been one of the Bialtana traditions now I was going to hold off a little bit we, we are due to talk about the uh, 
the the cross quarter festival so i wanted to do an episode on each perhaps uh Bialtana is the next one of course but it's not for a while so perhaps we'll cover some other stuff first but we will get back to that catherine thank you Bialtana is the marriage of fa fa male and female hand fasting yes Monique says, I like the way you speak about Christian things. Uh, yeah, well, I think Christianity uh, gets a very hard uh, time from a lot of people. Uh, what you have to do as a scholar is just to be careful to disentangle uh, the propaganda from what may be the actual uh, the, 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 the truth at the centre of it. Eric says, you know that the Druid was a Benedictine monk of Glenstall. His book on Celtic spirituality explained why the Trinity was accepted so easily by the Irish. I have heard that many Druids became clergy. Um, yes, uh, on Tahar Sean O'Dun, who I had the great pleasure of meeting once upon a time and who signed my copy of In Search of the Awesome Mystery. Uh, a wonderful uh, gentleman whose uh, fellow monks... Uh, referred to him as the druid <laughs> fabulous stuff it makes me feel uncomfortable listening to the christian writings about druids yeah, margaret you just what you have to remember is it's a little bit like when you read geraldus cambrensis you know uh, uh, and his take on on the ancient irish practices you have to be you have to separate out the propaganda as i said um and there doubtless was propagandizing going on um, and whenever you see, you know, in the Douth legend reference to the Tower of Nimrod, for instance, you immediately know that is uh, uh, an insertion or uh, an incursion into the original story. But don't discount it all as propaganda is the point, you know. And there are many more learned people than me on all of this stuff. And we will get to talk about some of those. By the way, I'm due to do... Uh, 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 an episode about the contents of my library now there are far too many books to do in one episode so perhaps uh, sooner rather than later we will start with episode one of what's in my library and we'll go through some of the stuff um, which may help some of you with regards to sources if you're looking for them angel barboni smith says this is awesome and there's a little dude there with with shades on well i'm glad you think so angel i've been enjoying it i have to be honest uh, Theresa McGuinness, our May crowning of Mary's statue reflects Bialtana, First Communion. I did the crowning. Exactly. Con modern continuations in Christian form of rituals and practices that go way back into the mists of time. This is so great, says Jen Howell. Uh, I love it. So grateful for you sharing these stories with us. I'm glad you're getting something out of it. I am all the time learning and not... Uh, uh, a, sc a scholar in these things I i'm just passionate about it and i'm very interested in it all so every time i read i see something that either i've read before and forgotten about or i get new information and new insights and it's lovely to share it with you guys because i'm getting i i get lovely ideas bounce back off you in fact what i'm thinking is uh you know in time that perhaps uh, live irish myths uh, might spawn a book uh, of mini chapters about each of the topics we've discussed uh, and so rather do, than doing big comprehensive chapters we, we could do sort of succinct short uh, summaries of each episode and make them into into a book so who knows uh, and some of your guys inspiration and all this is very important Celt is a later creation, is that right? Yeah, well, the Celts specifically, Henry, refer to an you know a, a, an Iron Age people who who uh, originate actually uh, uh, in continental Europe and are associated with Latin art, etc., etc. But there's a tendency to group all uh, Welsh, Irish, Scottish uh, mythology under the banner Celtic mythology, and people have a sort of a tendency to say ancient. Celticism and ancient Celtic things when they're referring for instance to Bronze Age and Stone Age culture which is not specifically true it just depends in what way you're using the word Celtic Celtic is an, an umbrella term I don't use it in my work mostly um, I try to just like I don't use the word pagan uh, I, I try to stay away from words that have controversy around them Liam Smith says, modern sciences are too segregated. We should go back to the Druidic approach and merge all the sciences together, together alongside the spiritual so we can see the whole picture. Can't disagree with you, Liam, and my whole approach uh, 
since the beginning of the exploration of the landscape and the monuments and the myths has been just that. On the one hand, the science, on the other hand, the spiritual. There's the there's the mundane and there's the transcendent. And uh, there is a place for both in uh, in 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 the in the mix up. Uh, John Dunna is watching. Hello, John. Long time no see. Hope you are keeping very well. And we're just finishing up. Sacred fires are different. Is this the Shannon's? Okay. Uh, Katrina says the big sacrifice was a sacrifice by omission to history of the role of women. Respect to the women. Bomal, Klachta, Birgog, Bechwille, Relbo, Dornal. There is little mention of them. And you're you're absolutely right, uh, Katrina. And of course, even in the works that we're quoting, uh, Druids are referred to as men as if women didn't exist. Um, in much the same way as Dinshanicus talks about all the men of Ireland coming to build doubt as if women didn't have any role to play in that, you know. But anyway, we will see. We will see. No better. Insulted. That's Margaret. Eric says the bonfires of my childhood in Limerick was a constant. It was prepared weeks in advance and always a great community act. The neighbours got together as they never would at other times. Singing, dancing and stories were seen and heard through the crackle and heat of the fire. I always, even as a child, felt that the fire was important and related to the pagan bowel fire. Well said, Eric, and absolutely right. And unfortunately, in, in modern times, the, the Halloween bonfires, which traditionally were such a wonderful community thing have been denigrated um, uh, and, and and the people who are involved in them castigated by local authorities who don't want uh, I can understand they don't want tires being burned in that but they've kind of really spoilt the fun of it they've taken the fun out of it you know and I always think about whatever about uh, St John's Eve which is only practiced in sort of uh, sort of remote rural parts of Ireland uh, Samhain or Halloween was the one that, that continued with great uh, gusto into the modern era and sadly is apparently on the wane um, because of basically political correctness Nick says love to hear the Irish language I'm, I'm, I'm sorry that I don't speak it too well it's one of my great regrets is that I, I didn't uh, take more of an interest when I was in school in Irish but I, I do want to go back and learn Irish and I'm always learning of course uh, Jen Howell says I'm learning Irish too translations equals excellent if anyone would like to yeah and if there are scholars on here uh, Katrina I believe you, you can speak Irish and there are a couple of others I, if we're speaking Irish and people are having difficulties with the translations perhaps you could tell us and if I ever butcher a translation or a, a, a pronunciation you, you can tell me as well okay that seems to be it thank you everybody for watching it's been wonderful that is uh, the second excuse me that is the second episode on the Druids there will be I think at, at least one more, probably two more, at least. As you can see, sometimes in an episode, we go back to familiar themes. We go back to episodes that we dealt with before. Tonight, we've re we, we, visit we revisited Crom Croak, who we met only a couple of episodes before. That's not a problem. Uh, I know there are new viewers all the time, and we're always treating the, inf the, 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 uh, the information in a new way and trying to cast new light on it, which is exactly what we've always been trying to do, which is why Mythical Ireland is subtitled Mythical Ireland, New Light on the Ancient Past, looking at the ancient past and shedding new light on it is there an app for refining your irish says paul garron i don't know but perhaps if anybody here knows of such an app please do tell us wendy holmes says thanks so much you're very welcome wendy slauncha sharon boggan stitch thanks anthony that was fantastic glad you enjoyed it Hel helene mccreevy mcgreevy should i say on youtube says thank you you're very welcome helene margaret ring thank you anthony a pleasure as usual always lovely to have you along margaret uh, one of the regulars and uh, one of the top fans uh, katrina tons of them start with duolingo yeah and are these reliable because i know you know you can type in stuff into google translate and it will give you an approximate translation but it, it mightn't be uh, the irish as people use it you know uh declan baron come west street for st john's eve Sorry, come west for St. John's Eve. Yes, I might take you up on that if we're allowed, you know, definitely. I told you when all this is settled down, I want to I want to start going out into other parts of Ireland and going to the landscape and going to the ancient monuments and seeing the rituals and festivities and, you know, talking to people about their myths and folklore. I want to do a lot more of that. So maybe we'll get that chance. Hopefully, fingers crossed. Linda Lowe, thank you for Thank you. Love your stories. Thanks, Linda. 
lovely to have you along. Kelly Sewell, you speak a fair amount of Irish. I can almost understand. Sorry, if you speak a fair amount of Irish, I can almost understand. I'm the same. I can pick up the meaning, uh, but individual words I'm not good at. And I'm not good at recalling them. But I, I just need to converse more in Irish and I'll get better at it. Teresa McGuinness, stimulating and thought-provoking. Thank you, Teresa. Very glad you thought so. It's been thought-provoking for me, certainly. And I'm very glad that you're getting something from it. Catherine Wall McManus, go to Margot. Anton August Tua, Ihoa, Ihoa, Tusafane, Catherine. Hopefully, you can join us tomorrow. Justine Marsh, Brian Marsh, something to listen to while you work. Hey, <laughs> yes, and you can go to the YouTube channel and see all the back episodes, or even better, again, they're all embedded into one uh, blog post on mythicalireland.com, which I'm just going to post in beneath this video now. And I've done, I've done it just there on YouTube. Uh, I'm going to post it in here on Facebook as well. Um, so you can send them there and say, look, you can binge watch. This is what Margaret Ring calls Mythflix, live Irish myths. Uh, and hopefully, um, you know, betwixt and between all the chatting and the comments and this, the silly things that happened, like the dogs barking and the plates smashing and uh, little incidents that have happened, that you enjoy it otherwise. Uh, also, uh, also, our lat memorize reliable yes okay thanks katrina um yeah maybe katrina would you send me an email uh mythical ireland at gmail.com with some inf more information about that i'm personally interested in, in improving my irish uh, i would really actually i would really like to to get an irish teacher to tutor me and even just a couple of times a week to 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 connect like this maybe on skype or something and converse in irish or to try to converse in irish and improve my pronunciation as well mariana dunn thanks very much lovely to have you along mariana i hope you had a good evening aaron Dret would love to come to ireland and stay for a whole year and see every festival hopefully you'll get that chance aaron please god fingers crossed Adele Perth says hello everyone I just missed the live I look forward to watching later hello Adele and I know that you are in Australia so a very good morning to you mate and uh, sorry that you've missed the live but sure look you'll be able to look look back uh, immediately after we've finished hopefully uh, Daniel Welch it's great if you want to know how to say his cat likes fish but doesn't explain the nuances yeah exactly and that's it that's why it's important to have a tutor as well uh, Katrina says Kula conch learn irish and many more okay good stuff you you need to do an episode on astronomical alignment says desiree riley yes i do i'm not sure how that pertains to mythology particularly uh, but we can make it mythological definitely so i'm going to just put that in and of course that's something i've been writing about in all my books so it's something that i won't have to do any preparation for really astronomical alignments and that is suggested by desiree R Riley or I L E Y. I wonder, uh, is there is there Irish in your background? Is that Orachley or from the Irish Riley, or is it a different Angel Barboni Smith? Thank you, thank you also, Angel. Very good night to you, Yvette. Thank you again. Hope you get to see that moon. Yes, I'm going straight out with the tripod and the camera. I'll be looking later too. Love the drone videos I have seen on Patreon and YouTube. Don't forget, if you're a patron of Mythical Ireland at the Bronze Age level or above. You get at least one high quality video every month that nobody else gets to see, at least for a while. Uh, and there are actually, I think, uh, several there available to patrons at the moment that are not publicly available. I'll probably release one of them to public now. Don't want to get too uh, uh, clutchy with them. Maeve Fianna Callan, Ihoa Tuha de Mitflix Academy. <laughs> August Ihoa Tosafane. Maeve, we'll see you tomorrow, hopefully. Margaret Ring, do it. It's the best experience ever. Correct. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Loads of thanks daniel paul kelly thank you margaret blessings rowan thank you salve forishi romifa thank you for your sharing and convictions sharing with such passion all your precious work and efforts well look i'm very glad to do it sure look it's what i was born to do isn't it you know and i love it on kriach katrina says kolosov sound sleep everyone stay safe keep washing your hands if you're on lockdown do your best to stay indoors Keep your distance from people, but do connect. Uh, we have this wonderful technology that enables us to connect. Uh, Margaret Ring, Mythflix forever. Goodbye to a Mythflix, says Aaron. And on Cree, Katrina is giving me her email address. Okay, we'll, 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 we'll exchange emails. Always love to hear the history. Have we anything on shamanic practice? Not really, Tom. Uh, we may be able to introduce that in various episodes. Um, there isn't really anything written about it. That's the problem, as much as there is about the Druids. Uh, Katrina, uh, Mia... Mila Mahogot, thank you. Jack Durkin, thank you. Anthony Graham. Netflix has been great. I'm feeling 
I feel I'm being officially educated in Irish myth. I don't know about official, but we're, the sources are good. I mean, you can't get better than Douglas Hyde, in fairness. Yes, Desiree says, I am of Irish Cajun background. Lovely, brilliant stuff. Ihoa, Aaron. And will the refust on show. What does that mean? What's or P H O S T? Uh, you want? Do you want my email address? I'll just reply to that comment. Replying, and I'll just type it in for you there. Hopefully, you'll get that. I hope. I think that's what you mean. Bev Lethbridge. Thank you, Bev. Good night to Canada, and I know it's only the afternoon there. Have a great day, Paddy. For, for a, an hour, I forgot about Corona. Look, that's what it's all about, isn't it? Is my is my shin? Yeah, there you go. Email. Yeah, good stuff. We're done, folks. Good night. See you tomorrow. Anthony signing off from Live Irish Myths, mythicalireland.com. See you all tomorrow night. Everything going.